when you don't have it, they'll make up their own. Uh, you want to build a, a culture of results matter, right? So ambiguity, not our friend. Specific results that we celebrate, awesome. Right? I guarantee you, Team Awesome had, uh, you said you had one side of the screen, right brain, or left brain was uh, all the metrics. And man, people get excited. Oh, we're getting close, how can we push over, right? Or, hey, this one's not going well, how do we remedy that? What's up with that, you know, why is that happening? So getting to a results matter culture is something that I have found to be very productive, and I encourage you guys to do the same thing. You know, one of the things that we used to say is I put my name on it, right? That's part of my personal vision and uh, just my, I don't know, I think of myself as just, I'm going to just tell you what I think. I'll be me, you be you. That's all I know, right? And so when I say I do something, I put my name on it. And, and the company would say, hey, if you're in purchasing and you make a purchase order, you put your name on that thing and send it off and it should be good. It should be no mistakes. And when you make a mistake, just own up to it, right? And deal with it. So the, I put my name on it's a big part of the culture that I think is a positive thing. People who feel like they're uh, in, a, in a positive culture will be excited and they'll, there's that electricity that happens if you're in the same building especially. If it's not, I would get your people on the phone or the Skype or whatever from time to time on a, you know, bi-weekly, monthly, even weekly basis depending. Yeah, so this is exactly the point. You want something transformational to happen? Do something transformational, right? All of those people, I, I don't personally have issues with, you know, far off reaches and so forth, but if you really want to build a team and you want them to be excited, get them on the phone together. Let them know they're part of something. They feel isolated. They feel alone. They, you know, you're not supervising their every move, right? And so when they feel like they're part of something, especially the guys who are kind of the far flung reaches, and they're like, wow, look at what we're doing, and we're getting things, and to the extent you share um, objectives or achievements with them, whether it's sales or otherwise, you know, hey, we grew 20% year over year. Isn't that great? Good job. Look at our, our scores are up here. Isn't that great? Good job. And you call out some of those departments. You are a case study. It's transformational. Uh, future opportunity. So another thing an org chart does is it says, yeah, sure, I'm customer service today, but where can I go in the company? You want to deal with retention? Give them a future. Right? You want people to stick around with you? Show them there's a reason to stick around, right? Um, remember, we're all stuck in our own head going, how are we going to get this business? How's this going to help me? Buh, buh, buh. And they're like, hey, I'm in my career. I couldn't care less about what's happening over here. I got my career. I need to deal with me. I got my family. I need to, you know. So everybody's kind of running in their own little circles of you know, selfishness, probably. And if, if you let them know there's a future, then they're much more likely to stick around and, and try to be a part of that future. Accountability is, you know, again, kind of knowing who you report to, why, when, your metrics, etc. We've kind of talked about that uh, a little bit. But, you know, that's part of the, I put my name on it. I have a, a personal accountability. Uh, one of the Amazon people or eBay person used the exact phrase, I own this. Do you guys remember that? So that's the right kind of culture. They own this. Now, they don't own it but they're responsible for it. And, but the more they think that way, the more you have engagement. Right? We talked about all those uh, engagement uh, factors. Uh, trust, again, culturally, uh, I say doing the right thing is the only option. I, far, I will lose massive customer opportunities if we can't fulfill. Um, I remember, I actually had a store not far from here, and a guy, uh, he just, uh, it was a big contractor, a huge account, he's like, hey, I, I gotta have a guy here Tuesday, and I'm looking at the schedule, I'm really good, and I'm like, I can't do Tuesday, but I can do Wednesday. We'll be there first thing in the morning, we'll be out of there by five, you know, we're gonna take care of this thing and get it done. He's like, it's, it's gotta be Tuesday, and, and he just harangued, harangued, and harangued, and harangued me, and I still wouldn't back off. And, and ultimately, he, you know, did not go with us that time. So, the next time he came back, and he's like, I gotta have a Tuesday, I'm like, can't do it Tuesday. And he's like, all right, when can you do it? And it was there. And I'm like, well, how come you just don't go get the other guy? Said, well, the other guy didn't show up, and then they, he didn't do a good job. And then, you know, the, 
his unintended consequences, he was so fixed on this date, he forgot about all the other stuff, like guys actually showing up. So when I say I put my name on it, it means I will do what I say I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it. And if that's your brand, if that's part of who you are as a culture, that's a very important thing never to let down. And for those who have responsibility, that's probably already in your DNA. You want a safe and stable environment for people, right? It's kind of the opposite of the, you know, what's happening in rumor mills and so forth. You want some place that lets them know it's okay to make mistakes. It really is. You should, in fact, I will say, and I've said, these guys get back me up for probably 20 years plus, I would far prefer people to make 20 decisions. Five are going to be terrible decisions, but not life-threatening. They're not going to hurt the company. Ten are going to be, eh, fine, no problem. But five could be awesome. And the more they're in that cycle of lots of productivity, lots of forward movement, there's going to be some breakage, you're going to make some mistakes, it doesn't matter. Make it right when you, you break something. But it's far more impressive to people to have a safe and stable environment. And I remember some of my team uh, making very large mistakes. Uh, Kathy, who all of you guys know, um, I can't, don't remember the mistake, but it's a five or six thousand dollar mistake. And I said, all right, listen, Kathy, because she was devastated by it, right? And, you know, I didn't love the mistake, but it's like, yeah, here's what happened. Do we know why? Do we know how we avoid it? Okay, and we learned. We're not going to make the same mistake again, right? Okay, cool. That's a semester at Yale or Harvard or Oxford, okay? So you just got schooled. No problem. I paid the tuition. Let's not learn the same lesson over and over. If you would learn other lessons, I don't care. It's okay to fail. Just fail fast and do it quick and learn. Somebody who makes the same mistakes over and over and over, not acceptable. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying it's okay to make mistakes. Promote the idea of more mistakes and more action is more likely going to carry you forward fast. And again, I've used that, you know, it's, that's another degree at Harvard. We're really smart over here. Uh, I hope we use that knowledge. Uh, and of course, the golden rule, that speaks for itself. If you were in their shoes, how would you want to be treated? If, I, I have said for a number of years, but not always, and it took me a long time to learn this, if, if we fire somebody and they're surprised by it, that's on us, right? That really is on us. We shouldn't have somebody ever be surprised that they're not making the cut. Because we should be communicating, hey, this behavior is unacceptable. What are you going to do about it? Hey, these metrics, they're not working. Remember when we did our position contract or results statement? You're not hitting the numbers. What are we doing to make this better? And then at the end, when they can't get the job done due to skills, knowledge, whatever, then you go, hey, it didn't fit. It didn't work out. Still like it. Hey, no problem. I don't have any animosity, but you can't work here. And, you know, the, the age old saying of uh, hire slow, fire fast, it really is true. It's not reasonable to steal people's lives. Their time is their life. Their career is their life. And by you going, well, it's uncomfortable, or maybe it'll turn around, but you're not doing enough to help it, fix it quick, or let them go on with their lives. Don't steal from people's lives. OK, Jeff. OK, anybody, does this look familiar to anybody? <laughs> if, you're, if you're running the show, everything goes through you, right? Uh, at least that's how most companies start up. So, you know, you got finance. Maybe that's still you, maybe it's a bookkeeper or whatever. And, uh, and so they report to you in product sourcing, maybe it's you or maybe you got somebody, they report to you in the photographer company. Everybody goes to you, right? Common. And that's okay, but it's not gonna work because as a bottleneck, right, I said, who is the bottleneck? You and me. This is how things start, but they can't stay like this. So to whatever extent that your organization feels like this today, your, your mission is to understand it, diagram, kind of know where you are, and then to move to the next level. So Jeff, hit me. Okay. There's a lot here, but what, the whole point of this discussion is to say, what's the future organization chart look like for you, right? And this looks like a mountain range because it's a freaking hard process, right? You gotta go up and down like crazy. So it starts with, as a business, now for you it starts at your why. Do I know my why? The organization you build for a lifestyle business versus a public company 
is so extraordinarily different, I can't even begin to tell you that without starting from a why, you're making a huge mistake. By the way, I'll share all these slides with you. So don't uh, worry about uh, any of that. I mean, there will be a small ongoing amount of cost, but. Uh, <laughs> no, so you guys will get all these. Uh, so once you're at the business level, you know your why, then you should have your strategic objective, which is how the business fulfills your why. Is everybody clear on that? It's a direct line. My why, my business, my business serves my why. Okay? Uh, now, I'm sure there's exceptions, right? There's some you know, companies out there that are, you know, have other objectives or whatever, but this is how it works for most entrepreneurs. You review your strategic objective and you say, Where I, what does my company look like in five years? Anybody want to share where they want to see their vision in five years right now? Marcos. Um, just, just owning several brands. And, um, and owning several or, brands. Owning several brands. And okay, quantify it. Give me, give me uh, a, a revenue, if you will. And by the way, I'm not putting anybody on the spot, but tell me a number, if anyone uh, will, what you're going to do in revenue in five years. Six point five billion dollars. <laughs> right. Yeah. We got Doctor Evil over here. Billion dollars. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, looking at at least looking at a fifty million dollar business. All right. So Marcos, in let's say five years, wants to do fifty million dollars. So is it possible to build a business from, you know, let's call it zero to 50 million? It does a lot more than zero. We know it is, right? Some of us have done. Uh, and so the, the reality is, you know it's possible, now you gotta just figure out how to do it. Yeah. And so you would say, in five years, what does my organization look like? Does anybody else have a different plan on what they want to, Sean? Um, we kind of would like to build a brand, build brands, um, sell it, Okay. Right, so uh, a, a flipping paradigm, right? So you say, I'm going to build a business, you've got a two year timeline, and then this is what I'm going to sell it. So you have a different kind of strategic objective, right? It's also, I, just to Please. add on to it, yeah, to be in a position of, you know, doing acquisitions. Okay, that's, sure. That's something that I always interested So part, you know, part of your way of achieving that 50 million, we're going to make an acquisition, and here's what those look like. Yeah. Uh, anybody else have anything else they want to kind of give us some other ideas? Yeah. I'd like to build a broad portfolio of businesses that kind of gives me stability that I don't have to run. Like I'd like to go to work on Monday, and then that's it. Just Mondays. Just Monday. Okay. <laughs> I was like, all right, what happens next? <laughs> all right. Well, freeing yourself from the org chart would definitely be on your list, right? And of course, selling. You, you have a, a little different uh, paradigm there. Anybody else want to share kind of a... I'm on the lifestyle path. I, I, 250 to 500,000 in sales a month is all I want. I want to enjoy my life by 50. Yeah. You know, I want to be able to invest myself in the other business and have time. Yeah, so lifestyle. Very different uh, org chart for lifestyle business, right? All right, I think that's enough. If anybody else wants to share, we're going to come to the org chart uh, shortly. So reviewing your objective, whatever that may be, Freeing yourself from the org chart, almost irregardless of what you really want to do, you need to think about how you can free yourself from the org chart. This is a, uh, a systemic challenge to you because whether you say, I only want to come in on Mondays, or it's like, hey, I want them to send me a check once a month, and I don't want to hear from them. Maybe I go to a board meeting once a quarter, maybe I won't. Uh, and how many people have read uh, Work the System by Sam Carpenter? Yeah. That's a good one if you guys haven't read it. Uh, but he, he took kind of an organization that was ailing and put in systemic thoughts and ultimately got to a point where they just sent him a check, right? How's that sound to anybody? Right? That's pretty good. Uh, so what happens next to accomplish those kind of objectives? You can get into planning, of course. That's where we define our functional departments. And we're going to do that exercise here in a second. I might turn it this way. Um, and that's where we create the management structure, the support, subordinate structure. Of course, there's some tweaking and refinement that goes along with that. Once you know the positions you're creating, you create position titles, of course. You create position result statements, right? Every system requires a result statement before you start, so you know where you're headed. And then a position contract. That's where you get into more of those details about, hey, I need to measure what's happening here, right? Uh, yes, you're in marketing, or you're in sales, you're in plans, or you're in you know, logistics or whatever. Here's how we measure you. And uh, the quantification is the, it's really the only fair way 
to have benchmarks. There should be some subjective things like, yeah, you're kind of a jerk in the office, you know, maybe dial that back a notch, right? I have a no a-hole rule. I've already worked with, I've had my, my share of a-holes. <laughs> that was not fun. Uh, and by the way, they were, rarely were the a-holes to me. They have a kiss up, kick down mentality, and that's toxic. But, you know, sometimes you, you may not know it, so. And then of course you'll finalize and publish and share that with your organization. You'll share it with your people now to go, here's where we are now, and this is where you fit into the organization, and here's where we're going in the future. And it's part of that vision. It's a steady process that happens, and it doesn't actually ever stop. Uh, Jeff, let's see what we've got next. Okay, assuming you want to build a, a big brand, assuming you want to decide if you want to exit, and by the way, I, I, I haven't said this uh, explicitly, but let me say it now. Even if you don't think you want to sell, if you build your business so it could be sold, if you build it so it could be completely systemic and autonomous almost, it's worth way more than it could ever be otherwise. Right? That's, that's what people are chasing you down to buy you. Um, okay, so this is just a, a little cursory view at a big brand org chart, right? You got your chairman, you got a board of directors, and you got a meetings from time to time, then you have your president who's responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, and then you start putting in VPs, and you know, sometimes these guys are operating level guys, C-level C guys we call them. Um, but you know, you got finance, you got marketing, merchandising, operations, technology, and then as you come down, and again, this is not fully, it's not big enough to do a full room chart, so we're going to do a little example on this. But, you know, your VP of sales marketing, this guy's reporting to him, and this guy's reporting. Now, generally speaking, you're not going to have a VP with two reports, right? It doesn't make sense, because he's supposed to manage more people than that. But I'm just putting this up there as an example. Um, most of the time, the farther down, you, you go, the work is more consistent, right? Customer service. You could have 20 customer service people managed by maybe two people, you know, two supervisors, and then, you know, somebody on the street can kind of keep an eye on the whole thing. However, you know, at, at the higher levels, I, I don't think managing, you know, eight to 12 people is a good idea. The more complex the work, the more dynamic the work, eight to 12, I think, is stretched a little much, at least it is for me. All right, so does everybody kind of understand the functional buckets? And then we create titles, uh, you know, kind of management, associate. Um, and we kind of, at least my brain always says, you know, you kind of have a president, vice president. You can do, again, you know, CFO, COO, things like that um, as an alternative to this. And then you do directors, managers, associates. Everybody understand that hierarchy? Can you explain it just a few quick? Sure. So, uh, when somebody comes in, they're generally going to be an associate. They're starting on the ground level, right? And they might even be customer service associate level one, right? And that's, I'm just getting trained. I, I'm just learning stuff and so on. And then you might have somebody through the process that says, oh, I've developed these skills and I've got this knowledge. Now I'm, I'm level two, right? Because I've been around a while. I have these skills. So I'm a customer associate level two, whatever. And it changes by organization, but your point is you want to give them a chance to understand the titles going forward and going upwards. So an, an agent or associate is kind of your basic level. Then you go to a supervisor level typically, then a manager level, and then director level, and then you know VP level, then upper, or officer level. Hold uh, on. Batteries? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, there's a charger. I've got a charger. You're lucky charging, but I just think that I go for it to where. How's your charge? No, it's the same one. I've got the stop. Uh, I'll pull it. Don't worry. Uh, there we go. Yeah. No, they got it. Okay, sorry. Thanks, Jeff, for uh, being yeah. so uh, on the ball there. Okay, so. Here, here's, here's kind of a, a paradox for founders. So, you're, you're CEO, you're chairman, you're president, whatever you are, and then you have the audacity to say, and this is a quote of me, why titles don't matter, who cares about titles, right? I have the best title, 
but I say people shouldn't care about titles, right? It's a, it's a silly equation at the end of the day, but people actually do care about titles. This is how they measure their progress in their career. So if you don't understand how to give them titles going forward, sometimes titles are you know, helpful even more so than races, because they say, hey, I came in as an associate, now I'm a supervisor, a director, or whatever. So understand that titles matter to people. It's their benchmark of, am I making progress? Sometimes as founders, we don't think it matters, right? We're like, yeah, well, the titles. You're smart, you just keep doing your job, just keep going. And it's like, no, you know, they're humans, they need to have that recognition. So that's why we have titles. So uh, I would have a yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Uh, they're a kind of compensation. And if, and if you put somebody in, you know, you're a small company and you say, well, so I'm the president and there's uh, five of us, so you must be a vice president, you know? Uh, uh, then, then later on, you get to be in you know a thirty-person company, and you bring in somebody, and you say, "Well, now you're a director. That's a pay cut uh, to, to whoever it is. Even if you raise their pay, they feel like you cut their title, you cut their pay. It, it is so. I, I'm even today. I'm I'm back to being a director, um, and, and that. But that's so that I have some place to grow. They brought me in as a director, and then maybe someday I'm a vice president. Maybe someday I'm a, a C level. Um, but it, but that's my boss thinking ahead because if you make me vice president, then someday later he came back and said, "Well, we're going to do this." You know, we got a vice president strategy we're going to bring in, so I need to make you uh, director. That'd be a pay cut. I'd be humiliated. You know, it's a bad thing. So start low. It's something you can work your way up. It is absolutely critical. Um, and the other thing is when you hire somebody here. But they're the only, you know, you might be in all these other boxes right now, but they're here. They don't, if you actually bring in the director of marketing later, they're not surprised by it. Does that make sense? So if you have a, uh, let's just say you hire somebody to be your content manager, they're managing all the outsourced stuff. But they're kind of the only person in marketing, right? So they kind of think they're your marketing guy or gal. And then you say, you know, I really need to get this sophisticated scale. So I'm going to bring in an executive with more experience. So I'm going to bring in a, a director, right? They might go, hey, why am I not the director? I should be in this job. If they don't have this chart, if they do have the chart, then they go, oh, maybe I can earn my way to that. And it avoids surprises. I cannot tell you how many times people just assume that they should be entitled to something or they should expect to be somewhere when... If they knew ahead of time, oh no, I'm right here, and I, here's how my path would go upwards, it's way easier. And by the way, what we're about to say is, today, you're in most of these boxes. So your next mission, we're, we're gonna draw an e-commerce functional chart here in a, minute, in a minute, but before you start worrying about people, this is a functional thing. Don't build your business around people. A lot of guys, they hire a, a receptionist. Oh, that receptionist, she does Photoshop, really awesome. So now, next thing you know, she's doing image photos and stuff for you. It sounds like a really great use, but you just created a really weird position when she leaves. Uh, who's doing photos, who's doing reception, you know, whatever it is. Whereas if you say, oh, she's gonna do, you know, reception here, but she's doing content over here, she's filling two roles, it makes a lot more sense. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. I'm going fast here. We're going to take a break in just a little bit, by the way. Um, so when you, we're going to make a, a functional breakdown here, but your name is in most of these boxes to start with. And then you start filling in other names as you go. Does that make sense? How many boxes were you in? Seven? Yeah, that's a lot of boxes. <laughs> you probably in a bunch of boxes too. I'm sure we all were on one level or another. The, the point is to operate as a business, these functions are happening, right? But ultimately, there have to be delegated and made into positions that people can operate. See this vibe and you guys kind of get it? Maybe we'll take a break before we start drawing this out. So here's what I want you to think about. We'll take a, a 15 minute break. We're gonna draw out what maybe is an e-commerce functional department view, right? Um, I'm not sure how relevant this is, we'll find out. But think about what functional departments you need to operate your company. And we're going to lay those out, and then we're going to take one department deeper. Okay, that's it. Is your example of the receptionist doing graphic art? She sees I have two boxes. She let me get two salaries. <laughs> I didn't.
Morning gets up. 